this morning before I share with you a word from the word of God. I invite you to bow your heads as we pray. Father, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight this morning. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. A few weeks ago, I shared with you a sermon on the stealthful attacks of Satan and how to overcome. Today, I will share with you part two of that message. One of the points that I focused on was the fact that we need to choose who controls our lives. As Joshua 24, 15 states, choose this day whom you will serve. There are only two choices. The times in which we live indicate that we need to make that choice very, very soon. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, the Bible states that in the last days, perilous times will come. We are seeing a little of that today. But we must not fear. Because in 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 7, it states that God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of love, power, and a sound mind. We need to use that sound mind to seriously study the Bible daily, especially what God has shared with us in the books of Daniel and Revelation. We have enough information to make an intelligent choice whom to serve. An important factor in the equation is that we can only seriously choose someone to serve if we trust that person implicitly. I have therefore entitled my sermon, I Packed Your Parachute, Now Jump, a metaphor of genuine trust. You might say, well, that is an extreme title. You are correct. But have you ever read the book of Ezekiel? God told Ezekiel to do some extreme things to emphasize his message to his people. He told Ezekiel to lie on his side, on the left side for 390 days, and then on his right side for 40 days, to cut his hair with a sword, cut his beard with a sword, Weigh it, bind it, burn it. And then he told him to lay on the ground and play war games with K tablets, all trying to share with the people what his message was. I decided to use the extreme metaphor to illustrate the point, as Beverly just shared with us, the point of trust. My key texts this morning, and I have two texts, Psalm 34, 8, and Proverbs 3, 5 to 6. First of all, Psalm 34, 8. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the one who trusts in him. And then Proverbs 3, 5 and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not onto your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he shall direct your paths. Now I have a question to ask. How many of us would jump out of a very reliable airplane with a parachute on our backs? That is extreme. I don't know how many of you would do it, but I imagine not very many. <laughs> Let me ask a question. Do you know what a parachute is? It is a canopy that provides safety for a person falling through the air, which otherwise could certainly result in death. Now, during the Vietnam War, Charlie Plum was a fighter pilot who flew his fighter jet 75 times into enemy territory. 
Each time he got into the cockpit of his fighter jet, he was required to strap on a parachute just in case he was shot down by the enemy. One day, as he flew over enemy territory in Vietnam, his fears became reality. He was shot down. As his plane fell to the ground, he pulled the escape handle and was ejected from the cockpit of his jet. As he was free falling, he pulled the string of his parachute and glided to the ground. He was captured by the enemy because they were there waiting for him. They shot the plane down and he spent six terrible years as a prisoner of war in Hanoi until he was set free. Upon his return to the United States, he was eating dinner at a restaurant in Kansas City and something extraordinary happened. A man about two tables away kept looking at Charlie. Charlie didn't recognize him. A few minutes later, the stranger stood up and walked over to Charlie's table and looked down at him. You're Captain Charlie Plum, aren't you? Charlie looked up and said, yes, sir, I am Charlie Plum. The stranger continued, you flew jet fighters in Vietnam. You were shot down. You parachuted into enemy hands and spent six years as a prisoner of war. Charlie then asked the stranger, how in the world do you know all of that about me? The stranger replied, because I was the person who packed your parachute. Charlie was speechless. He staggered to his feet, held out his hand and shook the stranger's hand. The stranger then proceeded to make a very profound rhetorical statement. He said, I guess the parachute opened properly. Yes, sir, indeed it did, Charlie answered. And I must tell you, I've said a lot of prayers of thanks for the skillful way in which you assemble the parachute. But I never thought I'd have the opportunity to express my gratitude in person. So this is a great day. That night, Charlie said he did not get much sleep because he kept thinking about the unknown man and what he did to save his life. What do I mean? The people who are responsible for packing parachutes have to be very skilled. Packing a parachute refers to the way the parachute is folded and how the strings are assembled into the parachute backpack so that the parachute will not get tangled when the parachute is open. We know of many, many deaths that have occurred that way of people not packing their parachute properly. And when they tried to open it, the strings were all tangled and they fell to the ground. Now, in a war, the pilots don't usually pack their own parachutes. They always depend on others to do the job for them. The pilots are trusting, trusting the ones who pack the parachute, trusting that everything is done properly so that all they need to do is to pull the string. My friends, with all the obstacles that life has to offer, with all of the challenges that you and I face on a daily basis, God is saying to us, do not be afraid, my child. Take the leap of faith because I pack your parachute. You have no need to worry. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not unto your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he shall direct your paths. Now, friends, trust is essential in all relationships. What if we could not trust our mothers? What if we could not trust our fathers? What if we could not trust our pastors? What about husbands and wives? Is trust important in your relationship? Let me share with you a personal story of trust 
Many years ago, while Jean and I were at Andrews University, something happened that could have ruined our marriage if we did not have the love and the trust for each other. While studying for the ministry, I decided to learn to fly because I wanted to be a mission pilot. I think I mentioned that to you last time I spoke. Jean was not excited about me flying, but she condescended, and I was happy for that. One day, when I returned from my flight training, I rushed into the Garland apartment to tell Jean of my flight lesson for that day. Before I could open my mouth, she recognized some strands of blonde hair on my black sweater. <laughs> she proceeded to ask, Orville, why do you have strands of blonde hair on your sweater? I was speechless. I said to her, I don't know. Because I can't remember at that time hugging a blonde person or any person, <laughs> a matter of fact. And so I said, I just don't know why the blonde hairs are on my sweater. Jean didn't seem troubled by the strands of blonde hair, but I was puzzled. Where did they come from? That experience troubled me for the entire week until I returned to the airport uh, for another lesson. Upon arriving at the airport, I saw something very revealing. Uh, the person coming out of the plane, the student who always had her lesson before me was very blonde. I knew her, but how could her hair get on my sweater? Never hugged her. When I got into the cockpit of the plane, I, some, I saw something that solved the puzzle for me. The instructor said to me, today you will be learning to fly by instruments only. You will not be able to look out the window. I will look out the window for you. You just have to look at the instruments, which meant that I would have to put on a hood that would enable me to see the instrument panel only. When we got up into the air, he gave me the hood. And as I looked at it, there on either side of the hood were swivels, swivels that would enable the visor to come down and up. And the swivels were there full of blonde hair that got caught when the student would put the, the hood on and take it off. It was very tight fitting. And as I looked at it, I said, uh-huh. <laughs> she was also doing instrument training. And so she had to wear it. As I would put the hood on, on my head and take it off, sure enough, Strands of blonde hair were deposited on my sweater. I could not wait to get to the Garland Apartments to tell Jean that the puzzle was solved. When I told her, she did not even look relieved because she had not given the matter a second thought. I was the one who was concerned because I couldn't figure it out. If Jean and I did not have a genuine love trust relationship for each other, that situation could have ended differently. The same is true if we do not have genuine trust in God, we could be tempted to give up and take things in our own hands. But on the other hand, when we trust in God and life appears difficult, when things do not turn out the way they're supposed to, God provides the parachute and protects us as we fall, thus saving us from certain destruction. God declares, I pack your parachute. Just trust me. Psalm 9 and verse 9. The Lord is a refuge for the oppressed, a stronghold in times of trouble. God wants us to trust him when life makes no sense. God wants us to trust him when the future seems uncertain. God wants us to trust him when we have no strength to take another step forward. That is when he says, 
I packed your parachute. And he gives us the power, the direction, the determination to continue on this journey of faith. Is there anything? Is there anything, friends, in your life that is preventing you from completely trusting in God? Anything that is preventing us from making that decision today? Now, let me ask a question. What is the opposite of trust? Some of you will give certain answers and I'm sure they'll be all correct, but I want to share with you one word. For today, the opposite of trust is doubt. One of the biggest problems we face as Christians is doubt. This is not uncommon. When we look at our beloved Bible characters, we find doubt was something they struggled with. You read the Bible and you see how many of our Bible characters struggled with doubt. Do you remember John the Baptist? He was going around proclaiming that he was just a messenger and that Jesus the Messiah was coming. Then when Jesus came down to the Jordan River to be baptized by John, John immediately proclaimed that Jesus was the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. John also recognized Jesus as the Son of God, as you read in John 1, verse 29. John was there in the river when he heard the voice of God saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. You would think that John was absolutely convinced who Jesus was. But sometime later, while John the Baptist was in prison, John's disciples carried a message to Jesus asking if he, Jesus, was a promised Messiah, the one who is to come, or if they should look for someone else. Isn't that interesting? A person who had all the evidence still had doubt. Twice, Abraham lied about Sarah being his sister in order to save his skin. He did not believe in the power of God to work things out. He doubted. His son Isaac followed in his father's footsteps because he also lied about his wife Rebecca being his sister. Doubt in the power of God. Abraham went in unto Hagar. As a matter of fact, it was Sarah who encouraged Abraham to go into Sarah. And uh, sorry, his Sarah encouraged Abraham to go into Hagar. And Hagar had a child for Abraham. You remember Ishmael? That's all doubt. Instead of waiting on God for the promise to be fulfilled, Abraham and Sarah did what they thought was best. They doubted God to keep his promise. Even the early church, that church which experienced the Pentecostal power of the Holy Spirit, that church manifested this weakness of doubt. Let me explain. Remember when Herod had imprisoned Peter, planning to kill him, Peter, as he had killed James? The church was concerned for Peter's safety. They therefore held an all-night prayer meeting in a private house, praying for God's intervention. Now, God heard their prayer, and Peter was released. Peter, on coming out of prison, decided to go to the house where they were praying for him. He knocked on the door. <laughs> A young girl by the name of Rhoda went to the door, but she was overwhelmed with joy when she heard Peter's voice. She didn't even open the door. She rushed back to the people, the church members who were praying, and she said, Peter is at the door. Peter is at the door. The church member said, Rhoda, you are crazy. You are beside yourself. 
you are out of your mind. Peter is in jail. Rhoda kept insisting, so they concluded it must be Peter's angel, not Peter himself. When they eventually saw Peter, they were astonished. They were praying for Peter's release. And when it happened, they couldn't believe it. They couldn't believe it. Friends, we pray for a miracle. Yet we wonder whether God can do it. When he does it, we're surprised because we were doubting his ability in the first place. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 23. Let us hold tightly without wavering to the hope we affirm. For God can be trusted to keep his promise. When, we, when he says to us, trust me, it is as if he were saying, I pack your parachute. Trust me. Put it on. Take the leap of faith. Move forward. I am with you always. God wants us to rely on him and his integrity. Integrity. When he says he's going to do something, we need to believe that he is going to do it. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean on onto your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he shall direct your paths. These words are precious to many people because we all feel the need for guidance. If we understand what this passage is teaching, and begin to apply it to our daily life, it will make a profound difference when we need to make a tough decision. Let's take a look at the significant sections of this passage just briefly. The first word I want to look at is trust. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. The word trust in Hebrew in this passage means to lean with the full body, to lay upon, to rest the full weight upon. To trust in the Lord is to rest your whole weight upon him, to depend on him completely. You remember last week, Sister Carol Dunbar spoke about this. The second word, lean. Lean not onto your own understanding. Lean not onto your own. The Hebrew word used here for lean means leaning against something such as a tree, for example. We lean on something when we are not strong enough to stand alone. The third word, understanding. Lean not onto your own understanding. Understanding refers to the mental process by which we analyze something. Understanding is the decision-making ability that God has given us. But don't trust in your own ability to figure out our path forward. Lean instead on the Lord. Rest your weight completely on him. Many of us go through life leaning almost completely on our own understanding. We like to be in control. I must confess that I number myself among that group at times. I like to know what's going on. I like to be in charge of my own destiny. But I need to always realize that God is all wise, God is all knowing, God is all powerful, and it's not about me. It's not about me, it's all about him. And I've got to let go of that wanting to be in charge. God says, put me first. Put me first in everything, including all of your plans all your thinking, put me first. I will direct your paths. Now, the fourth word is a very important word. I, I want to spend a moment on this word. In all your ways, acknowledge him, the word acknowledge. In the Hebrew, this word acknowledge is translated by saying, in all your ways, know, know him deeply and intimately. It's a kind of knowing that comes with personal experience. If you notice the word acknowledge, right in the middle of that word is the word no. I need to share with you something that is rather significant. In order to trust God, 
We must get to know him. There is a connection between this verse in Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 and the verses in Matthew 7, 21 to 24. Very significant. Matthew 7, 21 to 24 states, not everyone that says, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven. Fine so far, right? Many will say, verse 22, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils? These sound like religious people. And in thy name done many wonderful works? Then Jesus says, then I will say to them, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I never knew you. Wow. That is gut-wrenching. Those are harsh words. The people who prophesied, the people who did wonderful things, uh, Jesus is saying, depart from me. That word knew, I never knew you, simply means that God never knew you or me to be in a relationship with him. He does not know us because we do not know him. Jesus states in Matthew that even though you work miracles, even though you preach the gospel, even though you gave money to the poor, if you do not know me, you will be sent away on the day of judgment. But I can hear someone saying right now, but what about all the good things that I did in my life? What about the positions I held in the church? What about the awards that I got for my humanitarian work? The recognition that I got? Do I not get points for all of those things, Lord? The Lord comes back and he says, no, because you never knew me. In order to trust God, you and I must know him. That comes from a relationship with him. Spending time with someone seems to be the primary way to know that person. Commun communicating with them, going places with them. For example, in order for me to get to know someone, I need to talk to that person. They need to talk to me. And I need to go places with them. We have sweet fellowship. It's the same way with God. God talks to us through his word. We talk to him in prayer. We go places with him in witnessing. So friends, don't forget that word acknowledge. It means in order to trust God, we must get to know him personally. Number five, direct. He will direct thy paths. The NIV translation is, he will make your path straight. Imagine that you are driving along a road that appears to be very challenging. The road is very windy and very treacherous. As you drive, you discover that portions of the road are washed out like some parts of Jamaica when it rains heavily. This is the road of your life and my life. Here is God's message to us from Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. If you will know God in every area of your life, if I will know God in every area of my life, he will take personal responsibility to make our way straight. He will remove the obstacles if they need to be removed. He will fill the potholes if they need to be filled. He will redirect the detour so that what seemed to be a dead end turns out to be the best way to reach our destination. All you and I have to do is trust in the Lord, lay ourselves completely upon him for full support. Remember what I said and what Sister Dunbar said last week? It means laying your full weight on him, not taking any part for yourself. It's all about God. Don't lean for support on our own human understanding. In all your ways, in all my ways, know God intimately. But friends, 
let me be quick to say that even though the verse says that God will make your path straight, my path straight, there are times because of our stubbornness, God might have to make a detour like Moses and the children of Israel in the wilderness. And it's all for our own good. God might at times allow the road to be challenging for us to learn to trust him. That's the only reason why he will make a detour for us to learn to trust him. If the road turns out to not always be straight, it is for our own benefit, friends. But in the end, if faithful, the road will eventually straighten out. Friends, the story is told of Annie Johnson Flint, who died in 1932. She was a great poet and songwriter. Annie Johnson Flint was one of the best hymn writers in history. She got rheumatoid arthritis when she was young. Then she was twisted up in bed for many years. She also had cancer. She was incontinent and lived in diapers. She started to go blind. <laughs> you might say, well, is there anything else that can go wrong? In the end, she had to be propped up with pillows because of the many sores that she developed as a result of lying in bed. But through all of her pain, through all of her suffering, her faith in God only increased. Some people might have been tempted to give up with all that happening to them. But Annie, her faith in God only increased. Annie became thoroughly convinced that God wanted to glorify himself through her in her weakness, in her crippled state. Annie's testimony was, I believe in what the Lord has said. He has said, my grace is sufficient for you. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. Annie reached the place where she could also say with the apostle Paul, I will glory in my infirmities so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For when I'm weak, then I am strong in Christ. Now, one of the hymns, one of the many beautiful hymns that Annie wrote while she was sick is, he giveth more grace. Let me share with you the words. Uh, Michelle is going to be singing that song for us in a little while, but uh, uh, the words of the song, it's an old song. You might not have heard it. Annie's testimony, he giveth more grace as the burdens grow greater. He sendeth more strength as the labors increase. He added affliction, he added his mercy to multiplied trials, his multiplied peace. When we have exhausted our store of endurance, when our strength has failed, when the day is half done, when we reach the end of our hoarded resources, our Father's full giving is only begun. His love, it has no limit. His grace, it has no measure. His power, it has no boundary known unto men. For out of his infinite riches in Jesus, he giveth, and he giveth, and he giveth again. Friends, won't you make that decision today to trust him completely? And remember, to know him is to trust him. If you have not gotten to the place where you know him intimately, won't you take that step today? When he says, I have packed your parachute, now jump. 
is the leap of faith. We move ahead in faith, only trusting in God because we know him intimately. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man. Blessed is the woman. Blessed is the child who trust in him. Amen.